This is a preview of what we're going to talk about today. We will discuss how we scaled our data warehouse and overcame challenges along the way. We will also go over how we handled the costs of our instance and share the lessons we learned, as well as our next steps in data warehouse maturity. But first, let's get into some introductions. I'm Nicole, I'm an analytics engineer at BlueCore. And I'm Adam, an analytics lead at BlueCore. BlueCore is the retail marketing platform that turns data into revenue generating campaigns fast. BlueCore partners with the largest retailers in the world to make, the mo make more of their best customers. Uh, Nicole and I are members of the Data Ops team. Uh, we exist to service the analytics needs of both customers uh, and internal users by building scalable analytics products. We use DBT as the global transform layer to create a single source of truth for all of our data products. So what are we here for? One year ago at Coalesce, we had 125 models in our repo. As of today, 21,500 models. And I think everybody in this room would think, why would you want to do something like that? And we'll get into some of that. Also, how did we do it? Did we learn anything along the way? Would we do this again? And most importantly, should we do this again? So the purpose of this talk is to show you the mistakes and problems that we faced along the way, so you don't have to. So we built a data warehouse. We set out to build a consistent and dependable data set that we could use to power all of our use cases across our internal and external stakeholders. When we started this project, we knew that we would encounter some challenges. First, our IT convention is to keep all client data in separate data sets in BigQuery. When we query this data, each partner has their tables in a dedicated data set, and when we generate the data in our warehouse, we must keep this convention. Second, on a daily basis, our DBT pipeline would need to query upwards of 150,000 individual tables from our data lake. And third, we need to update the dashboards in our UI according to our freshness SLAs. So going into this project, we asked ourselves a number of questions like, can DBT handle the millions of events that, are, that span millions of tables? Can we maintain our contractual obligations to keep our customer data separate? Knowing that DBT has a one table to one model convention, can we even scale a DBT solution? Would it be impossible to maintain? Would we bankrupt the company? And lastly, we know that our tables and schemas diverge based on our clients' needs for bespoke integrations, so can DBT overcome that divergence? But most importantly, should we even try this? So yes, we are building a data warehouse, but there were other goals and limitations that made this project particularly challenging. At the time when we started, we had only two analytics engineers. We knew we had to keep our client data segregated. We wanted all of our analytics to come from the data warehouse. We wanted to have tests on our data, and we knew we wanted to expose this data directly to our clients. We weren't able to anticipate all of the challenges we would encounter, but we were confident that DBT would enable us to build a data warehouse that unlocks insights for our business and for our customers. During this project, we ran into problems so that you don't have to. So at a high level, we ran into these six core problems along the way. And over the next coming slides, we'll discuss how we've resolved each of them. So spoiler alert. Right now, we're executing around 18,000 models every 30 minutes on average. So how did we do that? And what do you need to know if you face similar challenges? So going into this, we knew that one table equals one model would be a problem for us. For every client, for every channel, we would need to create tens of models to capture all of the various events that our platform observes. And we also need to keep that data segregated. I extend that across all of our customers, and you can see how this gets very big very fast. Each model has to contain the proper materialization, tagging for orchestration purposes, and labeling for cost tracking. So do we really want to rewrite the same transform hundreds of times, once for each client? What happens if we need to update some of that transform logic? Having to maintain the same transform and configurations uh, in separate models would require massive overhead and almost guarantee poor quality. So enter the macros, where we define things once and reuse them often. We've got two different flavors. We have entire model macros and specific field macros, where the model macros contain all the transformation logic in a single place. We define all of our materializations, partition keys, and cluster keys. An example of this is applying our business logic for deduplicating all of the various events. And we also have field macros, 
which we use to prevent the redefinition of the same concepts that we reuse over and over again, like the standardized cleansing of columns, production of unique keys, trimming, lowering, and validating email addresses, or standardizing a case statement for reuse. While I expect nobody to read this right now, uh, this is an example of how those macros get leveraged in our model files to make them extremely slim. We've got tags, we have labels, we have macros, we've got the depends on comments that we use for lineage. It's got everything we need. So if you wanna refer back to it later, it's useful. Our second problem was adding and removing models at scale. Since we have hundreds of partners, this would require us to create thousands of model files when we create new pipelines. Or for another example, if we want to change some of the tags on our models, we would have to touch every relevant model in our repo. So to enable this, we leverage two different Python scripts. Our creation script passes in a list of clients using a seed file and generates all of what we need in these model files, including tagging, which we use for orchestration, labeling for cost monitoring, all the model dependencies, and the associated YAML tests. The delete script runs through our repo and deletes any files we need to get rid of in one step. So where are we at this point? We're putting this plan into action, starting with five customers and eight models using dbt core. We run these partners and models through the Python scripts and output eight standardized models per customer. At this point, we had really high confidence in our ability to build the queries. The main goal at this stage from, is to understand from an infrastructure perspective, where was our solution going to fail? And it failed fast as soon as we started to scale up even further. We found that BigQuery limits us to 100 concurrent queries per project. So we clearly can't run all of our customers in one project or else this will take forever. But the key highlight here is per project. So what if we made many projects? So that's exactly what we did. We used Terraform to scale up in a safe way to create all of our projects conforming to our security, uh, security constraints, our proper permissioning, and service accounts. We use each project for execution purposes only, but continue to materialize all of our data into the same storage project. And if you aren't familiar with YAML anchors, we use them heavily here in our configurations to keep them dry. On the left is our profiles.yaml file that we use inside of dbt core, and on the right is the combination of connection and environment settings needed for dbt cloud. Our fourth problem was the dbt cloud memory limits. When we encountered this problem, we had just moved onto dbt cloud to orchestrate our runs, and we had a lot of runs. We immediately hit limits on the number of models that we could execute in a single job. Specifically, 2,000 models in a single job was the amount pushing us over the limit. So to solve this problem, we needed our individual jobs to be smaller so that the model count remained under the limit. To do this, we created deterministic bins using a hashing function, which creates tags on each model. The deterministic nature of the tags is important because it guarantees that all models for the same customer are executed on the same cadence. This is necessary when these various models all feed into a single aggregate model downstream. And also, we benefited from the charity of dbt support, who very kindly raised our memory resources to help us get past this challenge. So up to this point, we've had four problems that we were able to overcome on our own, with a little bit of help from dbt support. We've got two more that we weren't able to solve on our own, or we've made slightly better but haven't fully solved yet. So, we continue to scale up, and we start to experience very long queue times inside of our jobs. And we learned about the concurrency limits that exist in dbt cloud. So at the time, we reached out to dbt support again. They bumped us from five concurrent runs to 10 to 20. We were able to get past our problem at that time, but luckily, dbt removed that concurrency limit altogether now, so it's no longer a problem for us. And our sixth problem is our project parse time. As we increased our model count, we started to see the time between run start and first model execution increase. The query times remained consistent, but our jobs were taking a lot longer to complete. We learned that dbt cloud functions differently than dbt core. When we were developing in dbt core, we were able to use the partial parsing on each run. But once we cut over to dbt cloud, we had to parse the entire project on every single run. So to solve this, we're looking into alternate orchestration tools like Google Cloud Composer, which would let us use dbt core and leverage the partial parsing. And after this week, we also learned there are alternatives like the mesh solution to help us reduce the project size and the parse time problem. This issue matters so much because with our SLA, we execute our jobs up to 48 times per day. So even a small increase in parse time amounts to a lot of time lost. So while 21,000 models is a lot, 
We haven't actually solved all the use cases that we look to solve for. So as we continue to scale up and grow, we will need to continue to evaluate performance and the solutions to continue scaling. So just to recap where we are at this point, our core transforms are built using macros, and the models that call these macros are generated with a Python script. We have multiple execution projects to help us overcome BigQuery's concurrent query limits. We reduced the model count in each DBT Cloud job using tags and bins. DBT Cloud no longer enforces job concurrency limits, so you can forget about that one. And we are exploring alternate orchestration methods to enable partial parsing. So overcoming technical challenges was only half of this. We needed to make sure that we didn't bankrupt the company as we went through this whole process. So we didn't land on the right solution right away. Uh, inside of our POC, we found that we needed a lot of more optimizations to make this viable. So we reduced our slot usage by 90% and our run times by 50%, which bought us a bunch of runway to continue developing and understanding how we could scale up. But the cost to rebuild all of our data on every single run would just be way too high, and we wouldn't be able to do it from a time perspective. So we had to ask ourselves additional questions around how much history do we really need to restate on every single run? What are our actual freshness needs? And what are the trade-offs and materialization strategies? And how do we reduce the cost to query as well? Aside from the cost implications, the time needed to fully rebuild tables will never allow us to meet our SLA. We knew that history doesn't change, but our data can arrive out of sequence. So we made an informed decision on the amount of history that we restate on each run to re reduce both cost and time. By parameterizing the amount of history that we restate as a variable, we benefit from maintaining our lookback window in one location. And this enables us to run our pipelines with an increased lookback window on a reduced cadence. Ultimately, this strategy allowed us to reduce the number of upstream tables that we touched every day from 150,000 to only 25,000. And at the bottom, you can see an example of us parameterizing that look back window to 120 minutes. So we had to decide which incremental strategy to use. In our use case, the insert overwrite strategy was faster, but it incurred a significantly higher cost. This was because of the volume of data in each partition and our need to touch at least two partitions. Ultimately, the runtime increase associated with the merge strategy was significantly less than the cost increase associated with the insert overwrite strategy. And this is why we chose the merge strategy for our data warehouse. So we don't only incur costs on the building of data, but also on the consumption of it. So we needed to make sure that we redu reduced the amount of cost when it takes to query it. So every single table has a date partition whenever possible. We ensure that our cluster keys are based on the most common where clauses and join keys. And lastly, for queries that are expensive to run or get run many, many times a day, we produce wide, flat MART tables that require no joins and are super efficient to query. After generating lots of models and using incremental loads to keep our slot usage reasonable, we still needed a way to understand how much this was costing us and how to keep these costs down. The first method that we used was BigQuery slot usage monitoring. Here we captured our slot usage metrics and we sent alerts to our team when the usage was higher than expected. And this allows us to identify both potential changes to the pipeline and bottlenecks where we might be able to optimize. Second, we built some hex apps to help manage our orchestration. Here we pull for long running queries and we can also kill our backed up job queues. In addition, we download our job run timing artifacts from the DBT API and upload them to BigQuery for us to audit later on. So along the way, we learned some lessons about our org, our function, and just everything. So first thing, we need to confirm alignment between our business users on metric definitions and business logic that was previously buried inside of our BI layer. We need to establish data contracts with our upstream data producers to know when we'll break downstream data uh, and reduce data surprises. And we also need to know where and how people consume data so we can meet them in their preferred environments. We also learned some lessons within our team. In regard to technical trade-offs, we chose to use incremental models in exchange for capturing extremely late arriving data. We also know that we have a more complex data pipeline, which adds interpretability cost, but this is um, a choice we made in exchange for the performance improvements that we see. And finally, like I discussed, we chose the merge strategy for our incremental jobs instead of the insert override strategy. We also learned some lessons about our role and responsibilities across the team. 
Um, first, infrastructure engineering and scaling is different than pure analytics engineering work. So we could have pulled in expertise from our other engineering teams earlier in the process. But the upside to this was that we were able to upskill our analytics engineers, and this has a lot of cross-org value. So in an ideal world, we would have cut straight to the final solution, but there were a ton of unknown unknowns. And without this journey, we would have never discovered the limitations and workarounds that forced our maturation. In reality, there were headcount constraints, faster than anticipated growth, and tight deadlines. Technically, we would do a lot of the same things again, like macros, incremental models, and keeping customer data separate. But process-wise, I think we change a lot of things. So what's next for us? Uh, we will continue to grow our footprint to capture more use cases and data sources. Although after this week, we may reevaluate how we scale up and apply some of the mesh uh, features that were just released. No matter what solution we choose, we will need to focus on reducing the parse time so we can continue to scale up. And eventually, we'll enable contributors from outside of data ops under the federated analyst model. In addition, we've added observability to our data warehouse. We recently brought on Metaplane to help us implement data monitors and alerting. And this is helping us to catch upstream data problems before they impact our reporting. In addition, we have exports. There's a dedicated project specifically for our standard client export views. This allows us to have a much faster time to serving client data requests. And we do this through the Google Analytics Hub. And finally, we have tests, tags, and labels. Um, we want to have tests with less noise to make them more actionable, add more tagging so we can have fine-tuned orchestration, and add more labels for cost monitoring. And after this week, we're also looking to add an LLM on top of our warehouse to help answer data-related questions. So in the beginning, we asked, would we do this again? For the most part, I think so. <laughs> I think we learned a lot this week about different way approaches that we could take that we'll go back and reevaluate. But for now, I think we're pretty happy with where we landed. So if you're interested in hearing more about BlueCore and how we can help retailers grow and retain their best customers, feel free to reach out to us on DBT Slack, visit bluecore.com, or come talk to us after the talk. Thank you. If you have questions, head over to Slack. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>